because of the virus that's going around you're scared maybe you might want to give them a call um if you're like me you have trouble finding the directory to get the numbers there is also a quick list directory i have one of those in my glove box but there are there are ways to get these phone numbers if you just want to make a call call and then there's a baby shower for trenton and allison phillips it's set for january 10th it's virtual as most things are these days please bring gifts and cards to the building and we will get them uh, to Allison's, what this says. Baby boy is expected. Gift registry is on www.babylist.com. January 3rd calendars are in the foyer. Is there anything else that we need to address or bring up today? Okay, I'm going to let Justin continue worship service. Thank you.
just forget about the user thing. Sometimes it's a different pattern. When peace I come in. bow before our Lord and Master, my holy and righteous and divine Heavenly Father. We thank Thee for this day and all its blessings that are ours to enjoy that You have provided. We thank Thee for allowing us to come here and worship and honor Thee in spirit and in truth. We ask, dear Lord, that You be with each and every one of us and as long as we've been found good and faithful, You'll continue to bless us you so have so bountifully in the past we ask lord that you be with miss peggy now as she bereaves the loss of billy and we pray lord that you'll be with the sick among our numbers you'll watch over them and the people that are ministering to their needs you bring them back to their much wanted hell we pray lord that You'll be with our visitors. You'll give them a safe destination to the next journey, to the next destination and safe journey. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with this church and we'll always be able to meet here unmolested. There'll never be any laws that, that will be put into place that will prevent this. We pray that you'll be with our country, Lord, and that soon the majority will see your ways and realize that it's your word that will judge us in the end we thank thee most of all dear lord for your son jesus salvation offered through him through obedience to your word in jesus name amen <clears throat> We gather here, and Jesus. 
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this opportunity we have this morning to gather together and gather around this table. We thank Thee, Heavenly Father, for that ultimate sacrifice that was made. We pray, Heavenly Father, for this loaf which to Christians is the body of Christ who died on that cross for remission of our sins. We ask now that each one examine themselves and take in a manner well-pleasing unto Thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Almighty Father in heaven, we also give thanks at this time for this fruit of the vine, which represents Christ's blood shed upon the cross for the remission of our sins. We pray, Father, that those partaking of this would think back upon that great sacrifice and partake of this in a way well-pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name we humbly pray. Amen. <clears throat>
song is I gave my life for thee in the books is number 354. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou mightst ransom me and quicken from the dead. I gave pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you at this time for all that you bless us with, and we ask at this time that the monies that are given, that the offering that is made, will be used for the furtherance of the gospel, the upbuilding of your kingdom, the salvation of souls. Many may be reached, many may be convinced of the truth, believe it and obey we pray that as we labor and look unto you for the increase that will be granted, that we'll be able to magnify you and glorify you for your, your mighty works and these things through the gospel. We pray that you will help us to be always generous in spirit, always dedicated to you. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Some encouragement would be to iron the saws if you're marking your books for number 948. Using books for that purpose. Before our lesson, we're going to sing as a deer. Sing both verses of this song. Please be standing. Let's go. Again, number 71 if you're using your books. Following the song, we'll have our lesson. As the deer pants for the waters of my soul. Well, Happy New Year! So good to see everyone here today. Very thankful for this new year that God has given us. And we have a tremendous amount of things uh, to think about as this new year begins. You know, last year was a pretty difficult year for many people. And a lot of people started to think about what was really important in their life. And based upon that thought, I put together a series of thoughts, perhaps, that would address, you know, what really matters. And that's the kind of series that I would like to present at the beginning of each month here in 2021. What really matters? And I thought that we would begin this series of lessons with the topic, that Jesus matters. Out of the things that matter, first of all, Jesus matters. I would like for you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 4 and verses 10 through 12. Acts chapter 4 and verses 10 through 12. And think about what Peter says in these verses. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now think about what Peter is saying in these verses. There was a confrontation that he had with the leaders of the Jewish people. They were coming into the temple to worship and there was a man lame there. And Peter gave that man a wonderful gift, the gift of healing. And as a result, many people flocked to him to hear the message of Jesus Christ, the true Savior. When we think about the message of Jesus Christ, this is the basic conflict 
between Christianity and the world. The world looks for salvation in many, many ways. Christianity teaches there is only one Savior, and that is Jesus Christ. And so, as we look back to 2020 and look ahead in 2021, we ask the question, who is the Savior? So many look to other areas of life to save them. So many seek to be saved by some other philosophy or teaching or most prevalent, a lot of people just simply look to self as their Savior. But the Bible is saying that none of those things are the answer. And that even in the context in which Peter was in, Jesus is the answer. You know, the question, who is going to save us, isn't just a spiritual question. It's not just a question that we should be asking here when we're gathered together to do quote-unquote religious things. It's a question that we need to be asking at every moment of our life. Who is going to save us? And the answer is Jesus. True life comes from Jesus Christ. John chapter 10 and verse 10 tells us, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly, Jesus says. But unless we're willing to acknowledge Jesus, we cannot have that life. In John chapter 20 and verses 30 and 31, and truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Life comes from Jesus. It does not come from any other source even though we mistakenly think it does quite often. The leaders of the nation in Peter's time would not accept the message of salvation that Peter preached. The message of eternal salvation as well as present salvation. And that is the basic conflict that we have in this world today. Who do we want our Savior to be? Jesus matters. Jesus matters. He matters because, first of all, He is the Savior of humanity. Secondly, He matters because He is the standard of humanity. And third, he matters because he is the sovereign of humanity. Let's look at what the Bible has to say about Jesus being our Savior, our standard, and our sovereign. First of all, Jesus matters because he is the Savior of humanity. You know, Jesus, the Bible says, saves us from sin and guilt. Ephesians 1 verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. You know, I think as Christians, we take the forgiveness of sins for granted. And I know that we are thankful for the forgiveness of sins, but... A lot of us as Christians don't understand what it is really like to be burdened with a tremendous amount of guilt and pain and suffering because of the sins that we have committed. We have forgiveness. 
And when we sin, we can pray to God and he forgives us of our sin and we can leave that in the past and we can go forward because of it. People in the world do not deal with sin as lightly as Christians deal with it. And what do I mean by that? I mean that they try to find other ways to deal with it than asking God for forgiveness. They've, they've got to work around it. They've got to self-justify, perhaps. Perhaps they've got to turn to some kind of substance to make them feel good, alcohol or a drugs, or maybe they turn to other people, relationships, and they get into all kinds of problems as a result, and the burden just grows and grows and grows throughout their lifetime. And many of them don't know what to do about it except to just keep on doing what they do. And that just increases the problem. But as Christians, we are blessed. We are blessed to be forgiven. You know, Jesus said, my burden is light compared to that of the world. We are blessed. We can, we can move on. We can go on. And we can let go of all those things that are in the past. Many in the world cannot, and they do not, because they do not have forgiveness. Jesus matters because he saves us from sin and guilt. Now, Jesus matters because he saves us from dead works. Now, this is a point that many of us don't really think about very seriously. But look at Hebrews 9 and verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? What are dead works? Some might say, well, it's sin. Well, sin is certainly included in dead works, but there's more included than just that. In fact, it's everything that someone outside of Christ would do. And you say, well, how is that possible? Because when one is outside of Christ, everything that he does goes into trying to save himself somehow. And as a result of that, he just builds up his own righteousness and his own righteousness is empty. His own righteousness is meaningless to God. His own righteousness does not get remembered by God. Isaiah said it like this, but we are all like an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And you say, well, uh, people who are outside of Christ, who are not Christians, they do good things, but it means nothing. You say, why does it mean nothing? Because it's not done in the name of Christ. God will not remember it. The world will not remember it. And those people who are doing those good things will not remember it one day. Dead works, everything that is not covered by the blood of Christ is all tainted by sin. That's what Isaiah is telling us here in Isaiah 64 and verse 6. All our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Everything that someone thinks that they're accomplishing without Christ is empty. But with God and Christ in our life, our works are not meaningless. Every good work in Christ Jesus is remembered and acknowledged. Jesus saves us from dead works. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It's not in vain. 
It's not empty. It's not meaningless. Because why, and why is that? Because God remembers it forever when it is done in the name of Jesus Christ. In Christ, every good work is remembered and acknowledged. And in that regard, Jesus saves us from dead works. You know, even, even though he doesn't have to do that, even though he would be right, that is, God would be right, To simply say, well, it's my work, you see, that's the most important. But he doesn't do that. He says, when you do the work of Jesus Christ in your life, for the sake of Christ, I will remember it and I will put it down on your account. That's a blessed thing. It means that we have meaning and value in this life. As Christians but as the Savior Jesus also saves us from the fear of death look at Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 and 15 inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death that is the devil and release those who through Fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So many people in this world work very hard, diligently every day to prevent death from taking place. But the Bible says we cannot stop death. It is something that occurs in this life, something that we must face something that is going to happen. But what can we do about it? We cannot fear it. And Jesus delivers us from that fear. He helps us to live in such a way so that we don't have to be constantly trying to invent new ways to stave off the inevitable. <coughs> Even though that's what many people seek to do. And many people get trapped and bogged down with many cares and worries in this life because they're trying to stave off that fear of death. Jesus saves us from that. In John 11, verse 25, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Now there is a Savior. There is someone who gives us something. Even though death is a certainty, there is something on the other side. And it is glorious. And as Christians, we have that wonderful hope to embrace. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus matters because Jesus is the Savior. But secondly, Jesus is the standard. He is the ideal person. You know, the world believes there is no ideal person. That your life is just whatever you make it to be. You can be what you want to be and everybody else can be what they want to be and they've gone to great extremes to demonstrate that. And I'm sure you can think of some examples in that regard. But the Bible says, no, that we cannot be just whatever that we want to be. That's not what God made. He didn't make us to be Whatever we desire, he made us in his image. And being in the image of God means that there are limits to what we can be in this life. In Genesis 1 verse 27, so God created man in his own image. 
In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now think about Jesus and who Jesus is. Jesus is the ideal man. He came to become the second Adam, if you will, and set things back to the way that God intended them to be in the beginning. Because what happened? Adam sinned and fell, and he was no longer the ideal person. And now he exemplifies sin in the world instead of God's standard. And so Jesus came, and he became the last Adam. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 45 tells us, And through Jesus then, today, we can know what God wants and what the standard is for a person and how we can live our lives in a way that will please Him. The world does not seek that. The world seeks to please themselves. The world seeks to do what they want. Be whatever they want. No limits. God says, no. You're never going to achieve human happiness that way. And why is that? Can you be happy with a broken item? Of course not. What do you do when you buy something from the store and you get it home and you get it out to, to do whatever it does and, and it breaks? And you're like, well, I can't even use this anymore. It's broken. You take it back to the store. Why? Because it doesn't fulfill the purpose for which it was designed anymore. <laughs> Do you think God has given us a purpose? He has. Do you think we were designed in a specific way? We were. Does God want us to achieve the happiness that we can have within this life? Yes. But how? By trying to take something that's broken and manipulate it in such a way so that it, it, it gives some kind of semblance to the functionality that it was supposed to have? No! But you see, that's what the world does. We'll embrace the brokenness, they say. And we'll make it our own. And we'll force you to accept it. God says no. I will not accept it because I have a standard and that standard is Jesus Christ. Jesus lived a sinless life. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 5, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him there is no sin. Peter says he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. 1 Peter 2 and verse 22. And because he lived a sinless life, he gave us the perfect standard for what it means to be a human being. And when we follow that standard, we can have what God wants us to have in this life, and we can be fulfilled. Why? Because we will function according to God's design. That's what he wants. Jesus lived that sinless life so that we could be righteous in him. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, he can take us, and through Jesus he can fix us, and he can restore us, and he can make us back into what? He wants us to be so that we can fulfill his purposes. And in doing that, we will receive great blessing. 1 Peter 3 verse 18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. You see, that's what every heart desires. Reconciliation with God. And Jesus accomplishes that by being the standard of humanity. 
He's the ideal person. He's the standard of right and wrong. And he gives us the path to true life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John chapter 14, verse 6. He said, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. John 5, 39 through 40. So many people say, God wants me to be happy. And they use that to justify doing whatever they want to do. No boundaries, no limits. Do whatever they want. That's not God's plan. That's not what God wants. Does God want us to be happy? Yes. How? According to our way or his way? Because guess what, folks? It's his way, not our way. And we've got to get onto the program that he has made for us if we really want to be happy. Jesus gives us the true path to life. Finally, Jesus matters because he is the sovereign. A sovereign is a ruler, a king, someone who is in command of all things. And Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And a lot of times from our perspective, it doesn't look like things are going the way that Jesus wants them to go. I suppose that even in a great kingdom where there is a single ruler, that a lot of times down at the ground level, the people wonder, what is the king doing? Things don't appear to be going the way. They should be going. But yet, the Bible teaches us that God is in control of all things. And Jesus Christ is reigning at the right hand of the throne of the Father. He is the ruler of the nations. Revelation 1 verse 5. From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Do you see that? The ruler over the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Sometimes it doesn't appear as if things are going the way we think God should do things. But the fact of the matter is, is that God is in control. And Jesus is the ruler over the kings of the earth. He knows what he is doing. Will we put our trust in him? Revelation 19, 15. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. But not only is Jesus the ruler of the nations, he is also the head of the church. Think about Colossians 1, verses 16 through 18. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Notice the order that's given here. By him all things were created that are in heaven and earth. That's everything, right? But then it comes a little higher whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, right? So there's the next level. There's all things, and then there's 
those who exercise authority over those things at a lower level. But they were created for him as well. But then notice next that he is before all things and in him all things consist. And notice this, he is the head of the body of the church. So there's the next level. You see, God looks on his people as being at a higher level than everyone else in the world. And why is that? Because they're his family. They belong to him. And he has a relationship with them that he does not have with the world. And Jesus is the head of the body. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. Notice the preeminence. He's preeminent over the created things, all created things. He's preeminent over the thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. And what else is he preeminent over? He's preeminent over the church. Now we get it in our minds sometimes that Jesus isn't the head of the church. Somebody else is. And we start causing problems and trying to get our way and trying to manipulate things so we get what we want. You can do that. But Jesus is still the head of the church. He's not going to give up his title. You're not going to replace him. He has preeminence in all things. Notice Ephesians 1, 21 through 22. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Jesus is the head of the church. And Jesus is my Lord and my King. And he is your Lord and your King as well. First Timothy 6 and verses 14 and 15, Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, that you keep this commandment without spot. And the commandment that he gave him was that he be a faithful preacher of the gospel. You keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing which he will manifest in his own time, he who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is king. He is Lord. And there is no other. In Revelation 17, verse 14, what happens to all those who make war with the Lamb? They are defeated whether it's an organized effort, whether it's an individual effort, those who make war with the Lamb will be defeated. These will make war with the Lamb and the Lamb will overcome them. Why? For He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with Him are called, chosen, and faithful. Jesus matters. Because he is the savior of humanity. Jesus matters because he is the standard of humanity. And Jesus matters because he is the sovereign of humanity. You know, the world challenges this. They don't want Jesus to be their savior. They don't want Jesus to be their standard. They don't want Jesus to be their sovereign. And one day, having rejected him all their lives, they will stand before him in judgment and they will kneel. But it will be too late. Then. It will be too late. 
and he will say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. But to those who acknowledge Jesus as the Savior, the Standard, and the Sovereign, he will say to them, Come, you blessed of my Father, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Notice that expression, thy Lord. That's who Jesus is. I want him to be my Lord. Do you want Jesus to be your Lord? <clears throat> Maybe this morning. You need to give your life to Him through hearing His Word, believing it, repenting of your sins, confessing Him as Lord, and being baptized for the forgiveness of sins. You can begin that walk. This is a great time to do it. The beginning of a new year wherein wonderful things are going to take place and happen. Why not acknowledge Jesus as your Savior, your standard, and your sovereign this morning by putting him on in baptism so you can have that blessed forgiveness of sins, so you can know what true happiness is by conforming your life to his will, and so you can live under his reign, knowing that one day he will invite you to live with him eternally in heaven forever. What a great day to do that. If you would like to respond to that invitation this morning, we're real willing and ready to help you in that decision. Or maybe you need prayer for some sin you're struggling with in your life or, or some challenge that you have. Maybe you've wavered and gone back to the world and realized that you've made a mistake and you, you need prayer. We're ready to do that as well. Whatever your need may be, if you will come forward now and make it known, we will help you while together we stand and while we sing. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Sing, sing. Our dear Heavenly Father, we continue our thanks for this opportunity we've had to come together and have fellowship one with another. Heavenly Father, we continue our prayers for those among our number that are having health problems. 
we asked thee to be with them and be with the doctors tended to them and comfort them and we pray that their health be, may be restored and be back with us soon. Heavenly Father, we pray for our sister Peggy has lost her husband Billy. We ask thee to be with her and comfort her as only you can. We ask thee now to go with us into her homes. Keep us and bring us back in the next appointed time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.